Hi, I'm Ryan Malone, Music Director at Herbert W. Armstrong College and Imperial Academy, based here in Edmond, Oklahoma, at the Philadelphia Church of God World Headquarters. Welcome back to the fifth lesson of our conducting tutorials. Again, these are based on a symposium we held back in 2004, and which was based on one I attended a few years prior. They condensed the years of instruction I received from my choral conducting teacher, Dr. David Rail, into a single day, and I am repackaging that material into an even more concise format such as this. So we have covered the basic principles involved in starting and stopping the sound on whatever beat or half beat where that may happen. We've addressed cueing while the music is going on. We talked about how to handle beat interruptions like fermatas and chesuras, as well as tempo changes like the accelerando or the retardando. In lesson four, we discussed how score study impacts your decisions as a conductor, how you manually move your arms, and what kind of choices you make about the interpretation. But as we alluded to at the end, it even impacts how you rehearse your ensemble, your score study does. And today, we are going to talk more specifically about effective and efficient rehearsal techniques. Here is another subject that's less about the mechanical aspects of conducting and more about your job as a manager of the time, usually the limited time, you've been given with your ensemble. First off, to tie this in with the last lecture, if you've studied the score well, you will see where the music is repetitive that will impact how you plan a rehearsal. You will also see where there are slight deviations from the repetitive, which you know in advance will require some extra drilling. Any break in patterns will definitely require extra attention. You can predict those mistakes and even preempt them, so that impacts how you plan a rehearsal. So right off the bat, much of your rehearsal effectiveness will be determined by how much you applied our previous lesson. We are in a creative field, yes, but creativity does not excuse us from being organized. I believed the more organized you are, the more you allow yourself to be creative. Being disorganized stunts creativity. Develop a long-range, mid-range, and short-term rehearsal plan for your ensemble. Long-range would be in a school ensemble, knowing what the end performance goals are for the semester or the year. The mid-range goals would be more the weekly goals along the way. Short-range would be what you plan to accomplish for each rehearsal. Have a written, even if loose, outline for each rehearsal. Know what you want to accomplish. My conducting teacher said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. He suggested having a definitive way to start the rehearsal, to give them a sense of start, to unify the energy in the room. He would always play an A and have his choir sing Every rehearsal, we'd be arriving and stirring, and as soon as we heard that pitch, we were conditioned to focus and get started. What he liked about that was he didn't have to nag us to start. Okay, settle down, let's get going. We have a lot of rehearsing to do. He also suggested listing all the pieces you are rehearsing on the board. We've been discussing this principle of leadership. Let them know where you are going. List the sections you plan to rehearse of which pieces, perhaps even the goals of each section. Let them know the direction. Don't keep them in the dark until they realize they have something learned and they think, oh wow, we, we're much better at that now. No, that's what you intended for them to do all along. And they have a sense of achieving what you set out for them to do. A rehearsal should be organized to get them engaged in the process and get them feeling successful about what they're doing. So when it comes to starting, Begin the rehearsal with a piece they are somewhat familiar with, or with something you know they will have a fair bit of success at right away. People do better when they are successful, or when at least they just feel successful. A properly organized rehearsal can keep morale up. Again, as stated in an earlier lesson, the most profound thing we can do is engage people and get them excited about what they're doing. 
Otherwise, they'll leave because they had that choice. Or they can spread the word about how exciting it is to be involved in your ensemble. All right, next, put more difficult pieces in the middle of the rehearsal. Keep in mind that their mental stamina will be stronger earlier in that middle rather than later. Finally, conclude the rehearsal with a familiar work or familiar material. Leave them on a feeling of accomplishment. Instead of ending on the hard piece and saying, well, we've got a lot to do on that one, see you next time. <laughs> the idea is to plan for some success in each rehearsal and give approval whenever possible. Go over a place you know they will perform well just for the purpose of doing it well and being able to give them appropriate praise. The praise can be as simple as great energy, but find something positive to say so that the critical remarks are more readily welcome. We are talking about leadership here. It's not just having knowledge and then you telling them everything you know and that they don't know. It's getting them excited about what you know and going through this learning process with them. Now, all of these techniques would apply even if you're only working on one piece. You can take different sections, easier sections, harder sections, more familiar sections, and keep the rehearsal momentum going forward. Overall, limit the amount of time spent on one piece or on one section, if all you have is one piece. Move on before frustration sets in. If it's just not happening today, it's not happening today, and then move on. Don't belabor a problem, especially a tuning problem, especially with choirs. Avoid over-drilling, especially in passages that are extremely high or low for the singer or even the instrumentalist. Know when your musicians need a break singers especially, but even orchestral players. Also, plan time in the rehearsal for relaxation, vocally or physically, depending on the ensemble. Maybe that's a good time to go over some announcements or some business about upcoming performances. Perhaps let a section of the group know that they can relax a little while you work on another area of the group. Or perhaps there's time to listen to a recording or do some mental practice, which breaks up the physicality of rehearsing if it's getting tenuous. Teach your musicians to mark their scores. This is important for singers, as many might not know how to do that off the bat. Instrumentalists may already have some know-how in that area, but teach them how to mark pauses, breaths, tempo changes, shaping, critical moments to look up at you. In choral singing, some breaths or pauses are not notated. Say there's a whole note at the end of a phrase, and then the next phrase begins on a downbeat. Tell them exactly how short you are cutting that whole note to give them time to breathe. Is it a quarter note? Is it an eighth note? They can mark those things in. And insist that they mark it. Teach your ensembles how or when to mark problematic areas. I always say it's where there is a break in a pattern. Uh, the music can trick them, so that might be a place to circle to get their brain engaged. Maybe it's a page turn. It's also good to have singers especially mark each measure, number each measure in other words, so you can easily just refer to a measure number for efficiency in rehearsal. This means you will insist they bring pencils to their rehearsals or have them in their folders. Again, instrumentalists are a little more accustomed to this. The most common sound in an orchestra rehearsal is when a conductor gives a direction and then you hear everyone you know, grab for their pencils off the music stands to mark it. Choirs need to be this fastidious about marking things as well. They need to take ownership for what you are telling them. Or as another conducting teacher once said, pencils are a sign of intelligence. Another rehearsal technique is to reduce or isolate elements of difficulty. Some call this isolating certain components. In choral singing, the three elements of what they're singing are text, rhythm, and pitches, and the best choral conductors deal with only one or maybe two of those elements at a time at first. Then more is introduced. And in an orchestral setting, there isn't text, but there are other detailed elements such as fingerings or articulations or bowings, things that can be isolated. Utilize the sequential teaching unit. A rehearsal is really just a series of sequential teaching units. Now, what are those? Well, a sequential teaching unit is a three-part process. In essence, 
tell them what to do, have them do it, and then tell them whether or not they did it. More technically, it's described this way. The presentation of the task. Tell them what to do, or better yet, demonstrate it. When giving them instructions, it's usually best to demonstrate what you want. There's a saying, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember. Don't just state that you want a crescendo, demonstrate it with your voice. So basically, show rather than tell. Interaction with the task, in other words, have them do what you've asked them to do, is the second part. Now that phrase, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, has one more phrase at the end. Let me do it and I understand. Feedback is the third component of this sequential teaching unit. This can be verbal or nonverbal, but they need to know if they sufficiently have done what you've asked. Even if the piece is moving on after you've, you've uh, given them the instruction and after they've done it, you can give them some sort of nod or some sort of reinforcement visually that, yes, you did that great, we're going to keep moving on in the piece. Now, each of these points of the sequential teaching unit can be improperly managed. In the first point, a conductor can give too many tasks, give their groups too much to think about and accomplish. When it comes to the presentation of the task, instructing or demonstrating, be concise. Avoid long-range or multifaceted instructions. Also avoid verbose instructions. Most of the musicians should be making music probably 90% of the time, unless listening or doing some sort of mental practice. And yet, some studies have shown that a typical conductor might spend 35 to 50 percent of the rehearsal talking. Just say one thing to fix and then let them try it. When it comes to young ensembles, kids are far better behaved when they have something to do, some activity to engage them. Keep them doing and talk to them as little as possible in a rehearsal. Sometimes conductors leave the second point off of the sequential teaching unit. They told them what to do, they maybe they demonstrated it even, but they didn't have them try it. They just said, hey, when we get here, we're going to do this, and, uh, and then they move on to a completely different section. This is an inefficient way of rehearsing an ensemble. Rather, reinforce the correct way several times. If they've done it wrong eight times, one time right isn't going to fix it. I might say, okay, that was great, let's do it one more time just to make sure doing it right wasn't an accident. So let them experience the right way more than once. Related to this might be having them do it wrong on purpose, what's called negative practice, alternating between right and wrong, and the extreme version of the wrong to get them to understand why something is wrong, and perhaps more accurately feel the difference between right and wrong instead of just taking your word for it. Most commonly, conductors or teachers will leave off point three, the feedback. They'll correct a task have the group perform it again, but the group never knows if they did what they were told. Possibly the, the conductor doesn't acknowledge that they fixed it, but corrects another aspect of what they just did, and so the ensemble is only hearing criticism. Rehearse beginnings, endings, and transitions more than anything else. How a piece starts and how it ends are the two most memorable parts of the piece for the listener. Make sure those are solid but also rehearse transitions. It's so easy to stop at the end of a section and then rehearse the next section, and we've never actually gone from one section to another where there's a new key or a new tempo. We have to get them used to crossing that bridge. Related to this is the principle of not always starting at the beginning. They need to be able to perform any section without it being reliant on one starting at the top and then getting to that section. Consider starting at the end and working backwards. It's not necessary to rehearse entire pieces every time. It's not necessary to run it all the time. These next techniques will relate mostly to a choral ensemble. Singing or playing softly will correct many problems immediately in a choral or instrumental ensemble. This will get their ears to shape up. This allows you to listen, makes them listen. And we always want them listening to what's happening around them. On the subject of you listening as the conductor, keep in mind that if you are singing with your choir, you are not really able to hear what they're doing in the most representative way. You're hearing yourself on top of it. 
and you're not going to be singing along with them in the performance, I doubt. Rehearse on neutral syllables or vowels to achieve the right sound or articulation. Rehearse more legato areas on lu or du, or perhaps on just a vowel. Rehearse more detached areas on po or mum or bum or doot. This eliminates the text element and gets them aware of the sound. Closing to the M in something like bim or bum gets them to hear the chord because it filters down to a hum immediately. This again helps them listen to what they are singing. Rehearse by speaking the text, singing beat subdivisions, one and two and three and four and one, you know, something like that. Or have them clap or snap along with their singing to develop rhythmic integrity. Speaking or whispering the words in rhythm can refine their understanding of the rhythmic integrity of the work. Perhaps have them sing the words on one pitch, maybe a dissonant chord just to eliminate the pitch element and focus on text and rhythm. Having them clap or snap on an offbeat can help discourage them from rushing or cheating beats. Going back to the neutral syllable idea, you can have them sing that neutral syllable on the beat subdivisions so that they hear exactly where the long notes end and the breaths begin. Say, having them sing eighth notes on do. Uh, you know, say the note's a whole note, but you're going to have them sing eight do's underneath, or maybe seven do's, so they know exactly where the breath goes on that eighth one. This can also be done by having them count numbers and subdivisions instead of singing on the text, as I said earlier, one and two and t and four and something like that. Rhythmic accuracy is even essential to the blend or tuning, the intonation of the group, which leads into our next tip. Remember that blend and good tuning are an effect, not a cause. The rhythm being accurate, feeling the inner pulse and subdivision of the beat, keeping the breath flowing, thinking of the momentum or motion of the phrase are all contributing factors to tuning. Two other contributing factors or causes of good tuning, which I must stress here, are usage of pure vowels and listening to the pitches around them, especially those from other sections. As far as vowels are concerned, Americanized or Anglicized vowels can bend pitches and compromise tuning. R's and L's and diphthongs like O and I. Some vowels are easily influenced by the next consonant or word. Make them match or unify their vowels. And a group not listening to the perfect fifths and the perfect fourths and the octaves. You know, these intervals. There, that will cause potential tuning issues as well. Some ways to get their ears heightened is by having them close their eyes while singing, or cup their hands by their ears, but have those hands cupped into different directions. This really helps develop that finely tuned ear first, and the sound will follow suit. So these are some tips on running efficient and effective ensemble rehearsals, as well as some tips there at the end for choral conductors. In our next lesson, our last of this series, I will talk exclusively to choral conductors about how they can reinforce and even teach some elements of good vocal technique. I hope you will join me then.